Hello, I'm Peter Okwache. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. The desperate surge and desperate wait after 50 people were trapped in a flooded mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Hopes of finding anyone alive are fading. Libya's renegade general Khalifa Haftar's rival government resigned after protests over the weekend. Never mind life on Mars, there's new evidence there might be life on Venus. Scientists say they've detected traces of gas in the atmosphere. Also on the program, we'll have all the sport later in the program with Mimi. And Chelsea begin their Premier League campaign with their Moroccan international Hakim Ziyech sidelined with injury. Thanks for joining us here on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Rescue efforts have been continuing today after a gold mine collapsed in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's feared about 50 people have been killed. Witnesses said no one escaped the disaster. At least 18 bodies have been recovered. The mine near the town of Kamituga in, the, in South Kivu province became flooded following heavy rains and is one of many unregulated operations in the country, as the BBC Lisa Marie Meshtak now reports. Over the last three days, hundreds of volunteers have gathered around the entrance to this makeshift mining site to search for any survivors. Working night and day, emergency workers have begun bringing out the first bodies. The rescue teams are there working and doing their jobs. We have to ask ourselves the same question, because as you know, the dry season has just finished in Kamituga, and now we have the wet season. This type of weather triggers such disasters because people cannot handle rain, and this is a major problem. Heavy rains flooded the gold mine on Friday afternoon, causing it to cave in and burying those working below ground. The missing include Kinyeni Furha's brother. Kinyeni had left the site just before it began to flood. It started after heavy rain. Then I saw a child running up to say water was rising in the mine and that he didn't think there were any survivors. We went back there and found only the pit filled with water. And that's when I lost consciousness. Dozens of people die each year in accidents in largely unregulated mines in Congo, where often ill-equipped diggers go deep underground in search of metals and minerals. The country is the world's largest producer of cobalt, crucial for making the batteries used in mobile phones and electric vehicles. As the rescue efforts continue, there's still a chance that someone will be found alive. But with every passing hour, that hope is fading. Lise Marie Mishtak, BBC News. The parallel government in eastern Libya has submitted its resignation after a rash of protests over deteriorating living conditions and corruption. In the latest demonstrations, protesters in the city of Benghazi set fire to the headquarters of the military commander Khalifa Haftar. Until now, protests against the situation in Libya have focused largely on the capital Libya, home to the UN-recognized government of national accord. Protesters also clashed in General Haftar's stronghold of Al Maj for the first time. Our Northern Africa correspondent Rana Jawad joins us live now from Tunis. Uh, Rana, how significant are these resignations? Well, first of all, the uh, resignation of the government, the parallel government in eastern Libya, still needs to be approved uh, by the parliament uh, that is based there. Um, and that, uh, as far as we know, hasn't happened yet. That said, I think it's important at this time to remember what this parallel government actually is. Um, it's east, it sits in the east of the country. It's not recognized by the international community. And really, over the last few years, 
um, it has acted as the political extension or arm or cover, uh, some would d describe it as, um, of General Khalifa Haftar and his self-proclaimed army, known as the Libyan National Army. Um, the real people in power, whether it is in the east of the country or in the capital Tripoli, which also witnessed uh, protests over the, over the recent weeks, um, essentially lies and always has in, in recent years uh, uh, within the hands of people with guns. And it's no different in eastern Libya. And I, I think uh, one has to look at this resignation um, from that perspective. Indeed, and you mentioned the fact that General Haftar's um, government, de facto government, is not recognized by the international, uh, uh, by the UN, rather. Uh, but they are in talks with the UN recognized government in Tripoli. Does this resignation portend an end to those negotiations, or will they carry on? Well, the negotiations are actually led by, uh, from the eastern side at least, they're led by the head of the parliament uh, that is based in Tobruk in eastern Libya. Um, and uh, that, that parliament was the last elected uh, body uh, after the last elections to take place there in 2014. Um, that was supposed to be based in Tripoli, but then uh, later went into self-exile in, in the east of the country. And, and then there were, uh, uh, there were divisions along political and, and military lines, and each took a side. Uh, so the negotiations won't really be affected uh, given this resignation, because we're looking at people like uh, General Khalifa Haftar himself, as well as the head of the parliament, who is based in the east of the country and is also seen as uh, largely allied to General Khalifa Haftar, um, and as well as the internationally recognized government that sits in Tripoli uh, and its prime minister there. Okay, Rana Jawad there, live for us in Tunis, talking about um, the situation in Libya. Thank you very much. Now let's take a quick look at other stories making the headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. The man portrayed as a hero in Hollywood movie about the Rwandan genocide has told a court in the capital Kigali that he funded an armed win wing of an opposition group, Paul Rusesa Bagina, who has been charged with terrorism, murder and other serious crimes, said he had given more than $20,000 to the National Liberation Front. He refused to plead to all the 13 charges against him, demanding he be allowed to plead to each one separately. Mr. Rusesa Bajina, who is a strong critic of President Paul Kagame, had been living in exile in the US. A corruption trial has begun in a Swiss court involving Jérôme Valk, a former Secretary General of football's world governing body FIFA, and the Qatari businessman Nasser al Khalifi, who is the president of the French club Paris Saint-Germain. Both face charges relate to, related to the sale of television rights for the 2026 and 2030 World Cups. Mr. Valka is accused of helping Mr. Al Khalifa's Qatari based broadcaster be in sports, win the Middle East and North Africa TV contract in exchange for free use of a villa in Sardinia. Both men deny the charges. The American software company Oracle has confirmed it wants to create a partnership with the video sharing app TikTok. The U.S. administration is now reviewing Oracle's bid with President Trump continuing to be concerned over data security. The tie-up must also be approved by Beijing. TikTok's parent company turned down a bid from Microsoft on Sunday. The funeral of a Ugandan woman found dead in the UK last month has taken place in Uganda. 34-year-old Mercy Baguma's body was found in her home in the Scottish city of Glasgow near her son, alone in his cot. Her death prompted calls for changes to the UK's asylum system. Miss Baguma's family say they are angry with the British authorities over the investigation into her death and that they are no nearer to finding out the truth of what happened to Mercy. Miss Baguma's sister spoke to the BBC's Patricia Oyela as the family prepared for the funeral. Three weeks after she died, Mercy Baguma was finally buried at home in Uganda. The family may have received her body, but her older sister says they have still not been told how she died. The family is not happy with the way the, the case of Mercy was handled in investigations. Because we would expect the UK government by now 
to have answers for us. It's three weeks down the road. It's coming to a month. We don't know the cause of death. We don't. It's not reported in the documents that were shared with us. Nothing. We don't know. Mercy was found dead in her flat. Her baby son was by her side. Her sister Sarah told me they want him to come to Uganda rather than stay with his father. We want the boy down here. If they have collected any money, let it be put in the boy's trust until when he gains the age of 21 to access it. He will live with us in our normal condition. If Eric wants to help the boy, let him help him from here. Mercy had lost her job after her right to work ran out. She was in the process of seeking asylum in the UK. Asylum seeking is a human right. It's a basic human right. All that she needed was help and comfort. But making it difficult for her to work, I don't know, but I don't think asylum seekers are supposed to be treated as, as criminals, as a threat to any given country, but they are supposed to be taken care of. Why wouldn't a developed country share with people who are in need? We are all torn. We are going to, it will take us time to pull ourselves together and accept Masi's death. And having said that, we are asking, we want something small. Why? What caused death? After all that long, we cannot have answers. That's Sarah Nakendo talking about her sister Mercy Baguma, who died last month in Glasgow. Now, during the height of the coronavirus pandemic in war-torn Yemen, there was only one functioning hospital in the city of Aden, which is home to more than a million people. Afraid of COVID-19 and with barely any PPE available, most doctors fled, leaving Dr. Zoha as the only doctor left in the city willing to treat COVID patients. Nearly six months since the virus spread in Yemen, the BBC is the first international broadcaster to reach the country to see how people are dealing with the pandemic. BBC Arabic's correspondent Nawal al mahafi has sent us this report from Aden. A city in mourning, haunted by what it's gone through. Imagine facing a deadly pandemic in a place where there are almost no hospitals to turn to. This is what happened in the city of Aden. As the virus spread, Abdul Karim's father, Ali, fell sick. He took his father to hospital. They did an X-ray and said my father had a bad chest infection. He needed intensive care. But the doctor said he couldn't stay because the hospital wouldn't accept any of these cases. They might have coronavirus. Abdul Karim went to five hospitals, but no one would treat his father. Afraid of the virus and with no PPE available, most doctors had fled and hospitals closed down. Except for one. Zoha was one of the only doctors left willing to treat COVID patients. Abdul Karim found her after a week of searching. He said his father was dying. Take him in. I said there's no bed, there's no oxygen. He had deteriorated and he could barely breathe. He was shouting, my dad is going to die, doctor, please. There was nothing I could do but take the patient in and put an oxygen mask on him. Ali died 15 minutes later. Stories like Abdul Karim's are all too common in Aden. The Yemeni government was completely unprepared for what hit them. They'd been fighting on two fronts, a six-year war against Houthi rebels in the north and clashes against Emirati-backed forces for control of Aden. As the silent killer spread across the city, the bodies were brought here to Al Radwan Cemetery. It was not normal. As a grave digger, this is the first time I saw this. It was worse than the war. 
these slips that he's showing me are the ones that people submit in order to bury their loved ones. He's saying that the ones in this bag are from the last two weeks and that in the last month or so, he's buried at least 1,500 people. Since then, deaths have come down. For an entire month, every patient who made it to Dr. Zohar's hospital ended up here until Medicine Sans Frontiers intervened. Before MSF came in, every single patient would leave the hospital in a white body bag. Now, some of them are walking out alive. It was like the difference between hell and heaven. With the number of COVID patients going down, MSF has handed over to the Yemeni government. This has people panicking. I am terrified. Everyone is. Because in this country, we don't have anyone in charge. If a second wave happens, I will fear for my son, my daughter, my wife, my brother. They will die. For now, there is a ceasefire in the battle against COVID here. But in a country that's facing the world's worst humanitarian crisis, there is little hope for the people of Yemen. Nawal al magafi BBC News, Aden. This is a Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me, Peter Okwache. Still to come, Cameroon announced their opponent for their upcoming international friendly next month. I'm Peter Okwache. Welcome back. Now, here's a question we've always asked. Is there life beyond Earth? Well, there's new evidence there might be life in our nearest planet, Venus. Scientists say they've detected in its atmosphere a gas normally produced by living organisms. The team of international astronomers say they could be another explanation for the presence of gas, but so far they haven't come up with an alternative theory. Here's our science correspondent, Palab Ghosh. Venus, could it be home to extraterrestrial life? There's new evidence that it might be. Astronomers have discovered a gas called phosphine in the planet's atmosphere. They think it could have been produced by tiny living microbes in the clouds. I was really surprised. I was pretty shocked as well. And at first, I didn't quite believe the detection. I just couldn't believe that we'd found it. But then once we set out and independently detected it through another telescope, that's when I knew we really had a solid detection of phosphine through two telescopes and, and that it was real. Confirmation of the detection was made using the ALMA telescope. In the mountains of the Atacama Desert in Chile, it's one of the most powerful arrays ever built. It found large amounts of phosphine across most of the planet. The researchers think that if it's been produced by living organisms, they're still there. The discovery of life on another world would be one of the greatest scientific discoveries ever made. But the researchers aren't making that claim, at least not yet. The gas could have been produced by some other means, but its presence on Venus is still a sensational finding. It's the strongest evidence that astronomers have ever had for the existence of alien life. The scientist leading the study told me she can't think of any other way that phosphine could have been produced other than by life. Everything we've tried, like maybe it's puffed out by volcanoes or um, brought in by meteors or bits of grit blow up from the surface and then have some chemical reaction. None of those things work. So I think we're excited because phosphine is really distinctive. It's something we know life can make and we know other mechanisms can't readily make on Venus. The big problem, though, is Venus is hostile to life. A Soviet spacecraft landing in 1982 confirmed scorching temperatures up to 460 degrees Celsius and clouds of concentrated sulfuric acid able to disintegrate any living thing in seconds something that even here, life could be possible. As you go higher up through the atmosphere, just as you do on Earth climbing a mountain, it gets cooler and cooler. So there is a habitable zone, a, a range of altitudes on Venus where it's not too hot and not too acidic, that life that we understand here on Earth 
so-called extremophile life, extremely hardy survival superhero type cells, could survive that environment in the Venusian clouds. Many scientists still think that the conditions on the planet are too harsh to support life and that there's another explanation for the presence of the gas. But at this stage, it's hard to completely rule out the possibility that alien life might exist on one of our nearest planets. Palab Ghosh, BBC News. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. Now so much sports to bring to you. Here's Mimi with all the details. Thank you, Peter. The new English Premier League season kicked off over the weekend as well as some other European leagues. Africa stars stood up this weekend and the BBC's Adebola Adebanjo with some of the stars who made it back. Yes, Mimi. I will start off with Pierre Mikko Bamiyan, who was on the score sheet for Arsenal in their 3-0 win over Fulham um, at Craven Cottage on Saturday. Ivory Coast Wilfred Zaha was up next and his goal decided that very cagey tie between Palace and Southampton that ended 1-0 at Selhurst Park. Mo Salah was up next and his hat-trick of goals helped Liverpool to that 3-4-3 win over Leeds United in that blockbuster tie um, at Anfield. Mo Salah, by the way, became the first player to score in four consecutive um, opening rounds in the Premier League since Teddy Sheringham did that in 1995. It is worth mentioning that two Nigerians went head-to-head -head on Sunday. It was Shimi Ajayi with his newly promoted West Brom and Leicester City's Wilfred Ndidi. It is very interesting to know that um, Wilfred Ndidi played a centre-back position. I am not too surprised saying that he started um, out in that role in the early days of his career. I'm going to take a very short trip to Spain right now. Um, it is worth mentioning as well that Geoffrey Condobia um, featured for all 90 minutes as his Valencia side defeated Levante 4-2 and elsewhere another pair of young Nigerian talent in Kele Chumwakali and um, 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 Samuel um, Chukwueze both played as their sides Huesca and Villarreal played out a 1-1 draw. Pretty fair if you ask me. Back to you Mimi. All right, there's currently underway a Premier League match. Wolves are leading 2-0 away to Sheffield United. In just over an hour's time, Chelsea begin their campaign in the Premier League away to Brighton. Now, Chelsea finished in fourth position last season. They've splashed out a lot of money in the summer transfer window. And one of those was on Moroccan international Hakim Ziyech, who will miss out in today's match due to a knee injury. But there's been a lot of talk about all the money that Chelsea has spent on their signings this summer. And can they win the league? I understand and I hope that Chelsea fans are excited because, you know, I'm not going to lie, we've, we've brought in what we feel are a high level of player that are going to improve our squad. At the same time, I also know what it takes to win Premier Leagues. Um, and I know that as a player and I know when I look around us and when you look at the teams that have dominated in recent years and particularly your eye draws towards Liverpool and Manchester City, they are a story that has, has run over a few years. In, in their, their own paces at different times, but in terms of recruitment, in terms of coaching, in, in terms of improvement, I'm, I'm guessing on the training pitch that then relates to the pitch. So it's not a simple story that bringing players must win the league. That doesn't work that way. So we hope we will improve. And more football news to bring to you earlier on. The Cameroon Football Federation announced that they will be playing two friendlies in the October window. It will be first against Japan and then to Algeria. They've named a 32-man European-based squad list, mostly European-based for that one. So it probably will be trimmed down closer to the time. Let's move on to athletics, where South Africa's Wade Van Niekerk has announced that he will take part on Tuesday in Switzerland. It will be his first international race since 2017. He has battled a knee injury. He has taken part in some local meets in South Africa since then, but that will be his first international. That's all the sport, Peter. Many thanks, Mimi. Thank you very much. And that's it from us here on Focus on Africa for today. Thanks for watching. See you again very soon. Goodbye.